morning of July 2nd, 1863, as dawn broke over the battlefield, the Union and Confederate armies had a couple of things in common. First, they both had decided that Gettysburg was the place to fight it out. Then, both armies were struggling with the strain and turmoil in their command structure. General Lee had two new corps commanders in Ambrose Powell Hill and Richard Ewell. Now, during the battle, Lee could never really get Ewell on the same sheet of music, while A.P. Hill's actions are an enigma to this day. Stuart, Lee's cavalry commander, was just now reestablishing contact with the Army, and the chief of artillery, Pendleton, was worse than useless. Then there was James Longstreet, who desperately wanted to move the Army of Northern Virginia around the Union left flank and get between it and Washington, D.C., forcing the Union Army to make a desperate and bloody attack. The always aggressive Lee would have none of it. No, the enemy is there, and I am going to attack him there. George Gordon Meade was only in his fifth day of command and overseeing a mixed lot of subordinates. His cavalry commander, General Pleasanton, was inept, although he was responsible for making George Armstrong Custer a brigadier general. Meade's chief of artillery, General Henry Hunt, was a superb leader and would play a key part in the Union victory. Meanwhile, Meade's relationship with his third corps commander, Dan Sickles, was strained at best and would nearly lead to the destruction of the Army of the Potomac. Contrary to the lost cause propaganda, General Lee did not have a plan to attack at dawn. To better understand the situation, he spent the morning conducting both map and personal reconnaissance. In a battle full of head-scratching mysteries, probably none is more so than the reconnaissance by Confederate engineer Captain Samuel Johnston. Lee summoned Johnston to his headquarters before the sunup was on July 2nd and ordered him to make a reconnaissance of the enemy's left and report back as soon as practicable. Sometime after 7 a.m., Johnston returned, claiming he had made it to Little Round Top, and in doing so, saw no sign of the enemy apart from a cavalry patrol on the Emmitsburg Road. How is it possible that he witnessed no sign of Union forces or other activity taxes one's credulity? If Johnston was truthful, then he avoided Buford's cavalry screen, Third Corps skirmishers along the Emmitsburg Road, the Third Corps bivouac north of Little Round Top, and Hancock's Second Corps moving up the Tawny Town Road. So this faulty information gives Lee the impression that the Union left flank is in the air, when in actuality, Union reinforcements are rapidly arriving. Lee must have been visualizing an attack on the Union flank, unfolding much like Jackson's attack at Chancellorsville two months earlier, which crushed Howard's 11th Corps. Here at Gettysburg, Lee spied a piece of decisive terrain that if he could occupy, it would serve as an artillery platform to support his infantry as it rolled up the Union flank. After the battle, Lee talks about this very point. In front of General Longstreet, the enemy held a position from which, if he could be driven, it was thought our artillery could be used to advantage in assailing the more elevated ground beyond, and thus enable us to reach the crest of the ridge. Longstreet claims he received the order to attack about 11 a.m. after Lee returned from a visit with General Ewell. Longstreet has only two of his three divisions near the battlefield, as George Pickett's division is still on its way from Chambersburg, where it was performing duty better suited to the cavalry. He also delays the movement of his forces while he waits on Law's Alabama Brigade of Hood's division to close up with the rest of the force. Longstreet never explains why he did not move the main body into position and allow Law to close up as necessary. One thing Longstreet did set in motion was to put Colonel Edward Porter Alexander in charge of three battalions of artillery to support the attack. This consisted of Alexander's own battalion and the battalions of Henry and Cable, which were from Hood's and McClaw's divisions. Alexander quickly moved out to reconnoiter the flank to be attacked and choose my own positions and means of reaching them. This duty occupied me According to the best of my recollection, one or two hours. Well, Alexander's artillery group probably moved south on what is now Knoxland Road, 
turned onto Black Horse Tavern Road and crossed the Fairfield Road by the Black Horse Tavern. Well, then things got interesting. Just south of the tavern, the column came to a portion of the road under the observation of a Union signal station on Little Round Top. As you can see here, the straight line distance between the two points is just under three miles. The solution to the problem was rather straightforward and involved bypassing the exposed portion of the road by moving along Marsh Creek, then cutting cross lots to regain the Black Horse Tavern Road, following it along Willoughby Run until it came to the Millerstown Road, and finally moving into concealed positions behind Seminary Ridge. The infantry column did not fare so well. With McClaw's division in the lead, it came to the exposed point and halted. Longstreet came up to the front, and after much discussion and rain of hands, the column did not end up following Alexander's route, but ended up backtracking, marching up the Fairfield Road, and then on to Willoughby Run Road. Well, during the halt at the exposed position, Alexander himself pointed out to a group of unidentified officers the route that he had taken, but was ignored. Of course, I told the officers at the head of the column of the route my artillery followed, which was easily seen, but there was no one with authority to vary the orders they were under. Meanwhile, in the Union camp, Meade was trying to make sense of the situation. His primary concern early in the morning was an attack on his right flank. Uh, indeed, he moved Gary's division from Slocum's Corps uh, from Little Round Top to Culp's Hill about uh, 5 a.m. Meade even contemplated an attack on his uh, right, but discarded the idea about mid-morning. He ended up placing Sykes Corps as his reserve just west of the Baltimore Pike and ordered Hancock's Second Corps to occupy Cemetery Ridge. The Union Artillery Reserve occupied the ground near the intersection of Granite Schoolhouse Road and the Tawny Town Road. His instructions to Sickles were to tie in with the left flank of the Second Corps and extend the line to Little Round Top. Well, Sickles' men, minus the two brigades marching up from Emmitsburg, spent the night bivouacked near the George Weikert farm. And other than some light skirmishing, the Corps was relatively idle on the morning of July 2nd. General Dan Sickles he was a political general, uh, rising to power as part of New York's Tammany Hall political machine. Uh, he was a congressman from New York when the war began, and he also gained notoriety for being acquitted of the murder of his wife's lover and the son of Francis Scott Key by claiming temporary insanity. When General Hooker was in command of the army, Sickles was known to drink and carouse with women, along with Hooker and the army's chief of staff, Dan Butterfield. Well, that did not sit very well with George Gordon Meade. Additionally, his two division commanders were opposites. Bernie was another politician who thought the hard-swearing regular army, Andrew Humphreys, was part of the engineer clique along with Meade and Governor Warren. And it was not a recipe for success. As such, the Third Corps did not adequately tie in with the Second Corps nor Little Round Top. As the morning wore on, Sickles and Bernie became more concerned about their left flank and the ground along the Emmitsburg Road, in particular an area covered by a peach orchard owned by Mr. Scherfee, an area soon to win notoriety as the peach orchard. Sickles was concerned enough that at about 1,000 hours he rode to see Meade at the Leicester House. After pleading his case to the apparently distracted and impatient commanding general, Sickles asked him if he would accompany him to examine the position. Meade declined, but Sickles asked for and received permission to have General Hunt view the ground with him. And in a very strange move, Pleasanton allowed General Buford to have his cavalry division retire from the field for rest and refit, before having another cavalry unit available to conduct the relief in place. This served to ratchet up the level of anxiety of Third Corps leadership. Well, further developments only added to the growing fear. With Hunt and Sickles touring the ground, Buford's cavalry rode off. It was also clear that the woods to the west were full of Confederate skirmishers. And around noon, Sickles gave Bernie permission to conduct a reconnaissance in force. 
the recon elements ran into Wilcox's Alabama Brigade from Richard Anderson's division of A.P. Hill's Corps, which at the time was the extreme right flank of Lee's army. Well, after a short but deadly firefight, the Union skirmishers retired back to the Emmitsburg Road. Sickles had seen enough. Buford had moved out. The enemy was enforced to his front, and the ground Meade wanted him to occupy was rocky, swampy, and difficult to sight artillery. Ironically, the Union Army would occupy that ground and force by the end of the day. Then there was his experience at Chancellorsville, where he had abandoned, at the orders of General Hooker, a salient of high ground called Hazel Grove that the Confederate artillery had occupied and used to devastate in effect. Therefore, around 2 p.m., Sickles ordered his Third Corps to move forward towards the Emmitsburg Road. General Meade had convened a meeting of the Corps commanders, but Sickles was absent. He sent a messenger asking Sickles to come to headquarters in no uncertain terms. So while the briefing continued, Governor Warren rode up to advise that the Third Corps was not in position. Meade turned to Sykes and ordered him to move his corps to the left and he would assist in placing the troops presently. Well, as the meeting broke up, Sickles arrived and an angry Meade told him to not even dismount but to return to his troops and he would join him. When they gathered at the peach orchard, Sickles tried to defend his decision to occupy the position against orders because of the need to secure the high ground. Meade reportedly said, General Sickles, this is neutral ground. Our guns command it as well as the enemy's. The very reason you cannot hold it applies to them. Sickles asked if he should fall back, but Meade simply replied, You cannot hold this position, but the enemy will not let you get away without a fight. And it may as well begin now as at any time. Indeed, as Meade parted and Longstreet's infantry moved into position, the Confederate and Union artillery began one of the most intense artillery duels of the war. This is the uh, monument to the 57th Pennsylvania. It even says on the monument that you know, they occupied this position and received heavy artillery fire, which is in their, uh, in their reports and testimony. What's interesting is that testimony also states that they received very few casualties. Let this car go by. They received very few casualties because most of the rounds went over their head and exploded on the other side of the Emmitsburg Road. Where have you heard that before? Had uh, one killed and they fired 1,300 rounds of ammunition. That one killed was a, uh, a gunner who as soon as they had gotten set up had his uh, head blown off. <laughs> 